Up tonight, there's another ancient radio. How old, you ask? Well, how does 1933 sound? That's right, I got a 1933 Rogers Majestic AM radio here. And uh, this one's going to require a little bit of restoration. Let's take a look. So I have another vintage radio here. This one, don't know the exact date on this one here. It's old. This is a Rogers Majestic. As you can see, here's the volume control here and the power switch. And over here is the tuning dial, which goes from 540 all the way up to 1500. And you notice down here it says police band. That's because back in the 1920s, the VHF radio and its FM modulation had not yet been invented. So everything was on AM. And what they used to do was the dispatcher would have an AM radio transmitter basically and they would dispatch the cars to wherever they were going and the radios in the police cars were modified versions of AM factory radios that could tune to a higher frequency past the end of the broadcast band and they would just tune the radio up to that frequency and it would receive the transmission for the dispatcher and what would happen is once the police officer cleared his call because they didn't have two-way radios back then he would have to go and find a phone and phone back the dispatcher and tell him that he's ready for another call and what they used to do in those days was there was a, a, a call box mounted on on telephone poles or on the sides of buildings and stuff there was a direct line back to the police department and they had a key and they'd unlock it and pick up the handset and it was a direct line back to the dispatcher where they could call in and say they were ready for another call and then they could go back to their car and start patrolling and another call comes in they can call them on the radio this radio could pick up such broadcasts in the back of this thing it's loaded with tubes and I'm not going to plug this thing in until we get this unit apart and change all of the old capacitors because this thing's going to be loaded with things falling out of it. I can hear them now. It's going to be loaded with paper capacitors that are going to need to be replaced. So I'm going to take the knobs off first. And that way I can remove the chassis. Looks like there's only one screw somebody's been into this because the other two screws that hold the chassis together are missing. This uses a quarter inch drive which is quite common on televisions and radios of vintage. Um, a lot of the American ones use these quarter inch they were just basically a quarter inch bolt, right? Hex bolt. Now the chassis should be ready to slide out of this unit. See, we've got a metal base to it here. We'll put the cabinet aside for now, and we'll take a look at what goodies we have in this radio. This is a four-tube radio. So these two tubes are going to be our front end and our IF tubes. This is a 41S. This is going to be the audio amplifier and that one is the rectifier tube so we're going to have probably an oscillator mixer here IF tube audio output and rectifier I've tried to find a schematic for this unit I've been looking for the past oh a washer just fell out of the bottom I've been looking for the past couple of days and I haven't found anything now somebody's already done some work on this a couple of these condensers here have already been replaced but most certainly these ones and this big one here is going to need to be replaced on it these ones for sure these ones for sure are gone and look at this insulation the insulation itself is this wire is also bad um, another thing that's bad on these these used a fabric type cord and well this stuff was really bad it was very prone to fraying and as you can see this one here is not in very good well the plug is broken but 
it's okay I won't be using this cord anyway this stuff frays and it cracks and uh, it's just a it's just a, it's it's a it's a recipe for disaster many a house fire was caused when like right here here's a prime example the insulation here has frayed and well that wire could you know just twist that and that's gonna break the insulation just like it has and you're gonna have a fire hazard so this AC cord has to go definitely has to go but first thing we need to do is we need to change out these paper capacitors looks like there's only three of them that I'm gonna have to change on this because these three have already been done so we'll change out these ones and then I'll put some power to this thing and uh, we'll see if we get some magic smoke or whether we get some sound I don't have a manual for this unfortunately I've been trying to find one but as I say I found three tube versions but not a four tube so first let's take inventory and see what capacitors I need and there's a good likelihood I have some of these because I've got some spares from the last series of tube radios that I've worked on so as we can see this is a, a dual 8 microfarad 450 volt so a couple of electrolytics I can replace this with we have a a point one and a point zero two and a point one at a point zero one at 600 volts so I gotta go check my stock I should have five capacitors of those values let me go take a look okay I've got a couple of salvage electrolytics here they're a little bit bigger 450 volts 33 microfarad and uh, they're both the same that's 33 microfarad 450 That'll certainly be more than enough for the eight that these were that are they're replacing, and um, I've got the other values of caps here, these film capacitors. So let's get uh, replacing. If we open up this box capacitor, what we'll find in here, it's probably encapsulated in a wax. Usually it is. It's just typically two capacitors. One will be these two wires and the other one should be that those two wires is typically all they are inside here if we open it up we won't see anything though because they are encapsulated but you'll just see that in here there's just two capacitors one runs along here the other one runs along there so looks like both the positives are connected together here one negative is connected to the chassis which is the wire is actually broken off. The other wire goes to, where does it go? It goes underneath here. And there's another, so there might be another cap underneath there too that might need to be replaced. But, um, what does it connect to? It connects to, I think it connects to that point right there. So we'll work at extending these wires and getting these new caps in place. One of the red wires here looks to be okay. This one's damaged. This one here looks to be okay up to about there. So I'm gonna cut off this one red wire. And we're just gonna use this other one. I'm gonna cut it here. We'll use that as the, the source. Same with the black wire here. I can just cut this one down here. That'll be one return for one. And the other one, we'll just have to attach it down to some point on the chassis here. I'm not going to obviously solder it down to the chassis because my iron will not get hot enough to uh, to do that. But we'll remove some insulation here. I'm going to put some heat shrink tubing over here and attach it to the two positives of the electrolytics that I'm replacing. So we'll put a piece of heat shrink tubing. So what I've done here is I've put some heat shrink tubing on each of the of each of the legs from the capacitor and I've twisted it onto the wire here. I'll solder the wire on that. The heat will actually make this small heat shrink tubing uh, shrink onto the individual leads and then I'm going to pull this other piece of heat shrink tubing over the connection. That way there's no chance that there's going to be any short circuits down the road. Shrink the first piece here. And then we're going to bring the second piece of heat shrink tubing up to completely cover the high voltage connection. So 
So that will keep this high voltage connection safe. As you can see we've got the entire lead is covered and then when it's dressed out of the way here I'll probably cement it to the back of the chassis here. Put some glue on there or something. Okay, the next thing we're going to connect is one of the negative wires and again we're going to put a piece of heat shrink tubing on that. And now we need to do the same for the other wire. This is the ground wire that went to the chassis. And uh, as you can see, oh, there's another another cap down here. I'm going to have to change. But, uh, what is this one? This is a 0 .05. A good place to solder the other wire will be to the lead here because I can get this one hot enough. I'm, I don't. My iron's not going to get this chassis hot enough. I need a big, like a 250 watt gun for that, which I don't have. But as you can see, somebody else tried to do it before and failed miserably. But I won't fail miserably on this. I'm going to attach it just down to this wire that's already soldered down to the chassis here. Okay, that's those two capacitors replaced. This is the AC cord where it comes in. We'll be replacing that with a more modern AC cord as well because, uh, well, this old, this old crap is just junk. Okay, let's uh, change the other four capacitors. I gotta find a .05. One of the neat things about working on these old radios is you don't have to be exact in your size. There's a lot of, there's a lot of leeway and these capacitors so this is a 0 0.05 so I could put uh, two 0 0.027s in parallel that would give me 0 0.054 which is probably going to be right where I need it to be it's just these are just by capacitor capacitors or I could put a couple of 0 0.022s which would give me 0 0.044 uh, either way we're, we're in the ballpark so either one either a couple of these or a couple of these is going to do the job to replace this one here so a little bit of a tolerance change is not going to affect the operation at all. Especially since something like this, it goes back into a collection. It's not something that's going to be used every day and listened to. Something like this, this is a collector that owns this. A collector might turn it on once in a while just to see if it's still working and then put it back on the shelf and put it back in its collection because the last thing a collector wants to do is be running up hours on tubes which are very, very difficult if not impossible to find. So you want to collect a radio like this you're not going to be listening to it every day. You're going to turn it on for those special occasions when you just want to see if it works. And uh, then you put it away again. At least that's what most collectors do. Uh, I, I know many people that collect radios and they're not their daily driver. You know, it's like an old car. You, you take it out to a car show. You drive it on Sunday. You know, you take it out to a parade or you take it out to a car show. And the rest of the time it just sits in the, in the garage and you, you put wax on it and you look at it. Well, radio collectors, it's the same. They'll, radio and TV collectors, they'll have their collection sitting on the shelf. And, you know, when, when someone comes over and they say, hey, that's a neat old radio. And they haul it out of the, off the shelf and they plug it in and they listen to something on it for a while. And then they shut it off and they put it back. So, changing the value of a cap slightly one way or the other is not going to cause any damage. And... Um, it's going to make this thing work again. What concerns me more is all this damaged insulation here on some of these wires, right? I'm going to have to change out some of these wires if I can because this is, this is a short circuit waiting to happen. This is actually going to this coil. So I'm going to have to actually probably tape this up or something just to prevent shorts. I don't think they're... Well, this is, this is B plus too. This is, this is the B plus coil coming right out, going right feeding into one of the tubes here. So this is one that we really have to pay attention to because if that were to short circuit, it would be a very bad day. First, it's going to cause damage, but 
it could pose a fire hazard, right? So we have to make sure that that wire is insulated. And it's also damaged down here as well, you know, and uh, I think what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to replace that wire. If not, uh, cut the wire and put some heat shrink tubing over it to insulate it. And that might be the solution is just to cut it, slide some heat shrink tubing over it, shrink it down, and then reattach it. That may be what I do to uh, resolve this, this hazard here. Now, of course, I've been through this before, but it's worth going through again. On these film-type capacitors and these wax capacitors, there's a, a the outside foil is connected to one, one lead, and you, you want to make sure that that goes to your low impedance side, such as your ground. And how you do it is you just take your scope, and you connect your scope probe across your capacitor under test, and take a look at the ripple, and then reverse the scope probe. And you'll see that the ripple now is higher in this direction. So this is telling me that this one here is my outside foil. Because when I put it on the other side, my, out, my ripple is less. Right? Because this is, this is the outside foil. So it's not picking up as much incidental. As you can see here, and if I reverse the leads, now we've got more. So we want to keep that in mind. It's always a good idea to check capacitors before you uh, install them. Even though they're not, they're not polarized, there is an outside foil. The older caps, and I've gone over this before, the older caps actually have a marking that says where the outside foil is, but that's not true with the newer ones. So I'm going to mark this one with a little negative terminal to indicate that that's the side that's going to go to ground. I have my probe in times 10, so if I turn my time probe down to times 1, you'll see it much, much greater amplitude here. There's one direction, and if I turn it to the other side, and there's the other one. You see, much less, much less noise is picked up from the air. So first I'm going to change this 0.05 with my two caps that I've made up for it. We'll just cut this one out of here. Now on here, the side with the band is the side with the outside foil, which is this side here. And it's, it's marked outside foil. And you guys probably can't read it, but if I clean it up a bit here, it says outside foil right there. So that's the side that the, the two that I put together that I've marked with the uh, outside foil mark is going to go to this one. This is the ground. You always put your outside foil to your low impedance side, which would be the ground in this case. And then the other side of this one's going to go over to where this other side was connected. I'm just going to pull the, the insulation tubing off and we'll stick both of these leads through here. Or maybe I'll just use some heat shrink, which I certainly can do. But I think this will probably be okay. Yep. And then that goes right down to this terminal right down here. And it's going to be long enough to reach so I can cut the old one off. And we'll just resolder the new cap right to that lug.
The next one we'll change will be this, uh, what was this one? This was the point zero two, which is, uh, I like that speaker. <laughs> That's kind of a, the speaker, it's got a screw in the middle of it here. Outside foil is this side here. It's marked outside foil. So we're just going to cut this one off this tube down here. And we'll put the Trying to keep these leads rather short too because you want to try and get them as short as you as close as you can to the original when it's the the ground side's okay but the the uh, side with signal you want to try and get this down as close as you can to the original I'm just going to twist it around here to the wire that I cut off make a good mechanical bond here first and then we'll solder it down The other side of the capacitor actually goes to B plus. The same wire is up here that's going to the, uh, looks like I think it's B plus, yeah it's B plus, all the red wires are coming up here. The same one that's going to this filter. So what I'll do is I'll cut this wire here. I'm going to try and splice it onto this other wire and we'll put some heat shrink tubing on this one because this is going to have the full B plus voltage applied to it This other one here that the wire is deteriorated so badly, I'm just going to cut it here and I'm going to uh, reroute this wire. As you can see, it's it's crumbling. The insulation is coming off this what like you wouldn't believe. And I don't want this wire shorting out. Unfortunately, it's a, a power wire. So and it's going to a component. So I'm going to try and just reroute this thing here. And we're going to put some heat shrink tubing over it protect it. But as you can see the insulation is all crumbling. So this one here needs to be protected. Now this wire is insulated so that even if it touches something, it's not going to have a short. Okay, next capacitor, I'll change out these two here. So here's another one here, the outside foil is marked here, same with this one here. So. So this one here I can just take right down to the uh, the points on the board here. Pull the, the tubing off of here. The insulation tubing. And just reuse it. Okay. 
Uh, that racket in the background is my heater that keeps turning on and off. It's uh, about freezing out right now in the middle of winter, so when I'm working on this is actually Christmas Day as I'm waiting for the food to cook. I'm waiting to get called to dinner, so I figured this is the perfect opportunity to work on this old vintage set. And I should add that this is one of my personal vintage radios here, so I'm going to uh, do my best to try and get this thing in full operational condition and see how well this one works. It was given to me, so don't know a lot of history on it, but uh, we're going to do our best to get this thing up and running. This side goes right to there. Of course, back when this radio was made, everything was all done by hand, right? All this point-to-point -point wiring was... All wired by hand, all these components put in. And this would have been quite the luxury for someone to have a radio back in, you know, 1927 or 1929, whenever this radio was made, but, you know, they were... Relatively expensive when you when you consider what uh, people made back then. You know, having a radio in your house was a luxury. And of course, this was before television, right? Long before television was invented, so. good old AM radio, that was your entertainment. You heard about it on the radio or you waited for the newspaper to come out the next day. Things almost ready. Try. This is the last of the capacitors. I'm going to change that power cord before I power to this thing, and then we'll we'll pi power and uh, see if it makes any noise or whether we get smoke or. Okay, that's it. That's the, That's all of the capacitors changed. Now, I have to change the power cord, which is this ugly thing right here. We'll untie this and pull this disgusting fire hazard of a power cord through the chassis. And I'm going to find something a little bit more modern to connect it up with here. I see someone just taped this cloth with cloth tape yikes <laughs> there's wires just taped together here no more wires just taped together we'll uh, we'll do this right we'll put some heat shrink tubing over this one
there. That will keep that connection safe. And we'll do the same with the new power cord, which is going to be put on here in place of this. This is cloth electric tape. We call this stuff hockey tape now. They actually used to wrap wires in this crap. And, you know, not only was it, it was just, it was cloth, right? And it would burn. If I lit a match to this stuff, it would go up. So here's our power point. Let me go find a new, more modern power cord. Bit of strain relief in the end, just a knot. That's how the old one was held in place. This old wiring is a joke. It's um, it's cloth with a rubber uh, coating, right? A rubber it's rubber coating on the wire, but cloth over top of it. And it's fine until the uh, rubber deteriorates and then it cracks. And the wire can actually poke through the uh, poke through the cloth insulation if you bend it. And as you notice, this thing doesn't have a fuse on it because no, none of these old radios were fused. So now, I'm going to wrap some tape around this as well, just to give me an extra layer of insulation. Turn the radio over. I don't know where these wires go. I think they probably one's a ground and the other's the antenna. One's going to ground the black one. This is the external antenna. This one. It comes up right here. That's what those are, because that's the antenna. So I'm gonna plug this thing into my current limiting light bulb. I'll be redoing this thing one of these days too. And we'll plug the other side of that into the isolation transformer. Power is off on the radio now, so we'll turn the power on so I don't have to touch this thing. Not that I'm worried because I'm on an isolation transformer, but let's turn this thing on and see what type of power this thing draws. So there's the current limiting bulb. Power on. And I see that the filaments are starting to warm up. See if we get any noise. We won't get anything until the rectifier warms up here. You can see the tubes are starting to warm up. And here's something. Well, we're oscillating. I wonder 
if there's a good connection being made here. I don't know if there's any voltage on the caps of these tubes, so let's just check and see. Nine volts. So this one's obviously the oscillator. It's almost like a theremin. And play this thing like it's a theremin. Tubes are all getting warm. Uh, I can see, well this one's lighting up, this one's lighting up. I can't see if there's any light from these ones, but there must be. They're doing something. So one thing we know is that the audio amplifier is working. As uh, if it wasn't working, we wouldn't get any sound. It seems to have, a, a, the oscillator seems to be working. But I'm not, I don't think this is a, uh, this isn't a super head. This is probably a regenerative receiver. I'm going to have to try and find some data on this. Because uh, it's not working properly. We're going to check and just check some of the voltages here. See what type of voltages I've got. Turn on the power. I'm not going through the light bulb now because I know there's, there's no short. So it, I'm still on my isolation transformer, but I'm not through the, the current limiter at this point. I don't think I need to be because uh, we know that uh, it's not drawing too much current. Two hundred seventeen volts, two hundred twenty volts. So my B plus is 220. I think it should be a little higher than that. But I don't know because I don't have a manual for this thing. This is the tube down here, the rectifier tube. This is the transformer going into it. And the B plus comes off. B plus on here. Seven. Six volts. Uh, Seventeen. Two hundred fifteen. Yeah, this is the audio output tube. It'll have B plus on it too. One of these ones. That's it there. Fifteen. Okay, now I have to try and find some service data for this radio. I've been looking. I may have to uh, 
see the 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 version I looked up when I looked up this chassis I found one but it was a three tube version not a four tube so I have to uh, try and find the RF sections in a comparable chassis and we'll take it from there now it's back to researching for a schematic so I've dug up a uh, I've dug up a schematic for this that is fairly close and by fairly close I mean the schematic that's actually listed for this model 903-4 or 403-4 the chassis 371 which is what the, the uh, panel the tag on the back of this set indicates as a, a chassis 371 well the schematic shows it's a three tube set but as you can see on this one there's clearly four tubes one two three four the difference being the audio output tube on the schematic it's drawn with an 89 R S which is a combination rectifier and pentode output tube in one glass jar one glass envelope and this one uses a separate audio output and a separate rectifier but other than that they look to be the same it's got the same front end the 6A7 and the, 6, and the 6F7 which is the IF and detector it's a single stage IF 465 kilocycle of course mod more modern stuff is uh, 455 if you notice where the volume control is mounted here here's the volume pot it actually changes the voltage applied to the cathode of the 6A7 tube so this is a quite a different setup than what we're used to seeing so basically it's reducing the actual gain of the tube itself so this is the your combination oscillator and front end on this receiver and your mixer and this tube would be your mixer I guess this is your mixer detector this is well before my time so I haven't uh, worked on anything this old yet so it's kind of a learning uh, project for me too because this is this is well before my time I worked on a lot of super heterodyne uh, receivers but this one here is actually going back before that this is more like a regenerative receiver anyway I gotta do a lot of wiring repair on this receiver as well because if we look down here take a look at the blue wire here coming off of the uh, 6A7 tube the insulation is just crumbling so I'm gonna have to uh, down over here right I gotta have to replace all these wires so let's do that let's replace all the crumbling wires and see if I can uh, make any improvement to this thing other than the fact that it whistles it's it's a great uh, theremin right now you move near the tubes and it just whistles but um, hmm okay let's change out some wires here and see if I can uh, make any headway on this old antique so I've got myself some high voltage rated wire off of an old fluorescent ballast so this wire is rated for several hundred volts what's my rating on here 600 volts we're gonna replace all these crumbling wires that uh, I can get at I believe this one here is the one that goes up to the volume control it's going down to what pin is it here on this tube it looks like that one goes up it goes up through the chassis here and I believe it's the one that ends up at the volume control anyway let's change it out I actually even soldered the uh, bracket here this is the blue wire here that I'm after they soldered this bracket down to the chassis 
but this is the wire here. You can see the insulation is all breaking on this. This is the volume control. And as you can see, what the volume control on this does is it just grounds that wire out when you turn up the volume. So let's just, uh, we'll cut this other one out of here. And we'll replace it. At least these wires aren't shot on the switch. I'm hoping after all this effort that the tubes that are in this radio are still serviceable. Because I have a feeling that trying to get some of these old tubes might be uh, next to impossible. I could be wrong. I'm sure there's some collectors that have got them, but uh, just what a tube like this would be worth is uh, another question. Okay, that's the, the uh, volume control wire. So we attach the screws here to hold this unit on. Okay, it's going to remove the, the blue wire here that's deteriorating. You can see the insulation just comes right off this. This is the problem with these rubber insulated wires is that they just they deteriorate and you end up with a real hazard. As you can see. So now I gotta get this other new wire. We'll just route this back about the same way that the other one went. And bring it right back around here. It's going to go down to now my, my schematic that I have here for this radio is not the correct one. The schematic I have actually is drawn for a different output tube than this radio has, but the front end is the same. So take that wire out of there. Okay, that wire is done. I also have to change this other blue wire here that's going to this coil as it's also shot and insulation's cracked. So we'll just take that one off there. That one goes up to the tuning capacitor right up here. As you can see, the insulation's all cracked on this one as well.
And this other wire here, I think it's also shot. Yeah, this one here is also bad. So this one here should also be replaced. You can see the insulation is just crumbling. This is all rubber insulation, this stuff, right? That's the problem. Is it's 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 rubber insulation and it just doesn't it after a number of years just deteriorates and the rubber just falls off, cracks and comes apart. Okay, that one's done. I'm gonna do the other one here. This, is, this wire here goes from the other side of this coil down to the tube. It's going right down to right down to there. I can just see the thumbs down right now because I'm using black wire for everything. And you see, somebody's going to take somebody is going to take offense to that that I haven't used colored wire. regardless of the fact that no one else other than me is ever going to work on this thing. This wire goes down to this, right down into here I believe. That goes to this side of the coil here. This is also the B plus coming in, so we're going to take that one out as well, because this wire here is also, as you can see, is crumbling back here a little further. So this wire is coming out and being replaced.
I think this one here is also bad. Like that one here, it's the same wire, it's just coming off of the uh, filter. That's it there. The other end of it goes over here. As you can see, this is also this is just really bad wire. Yeah, that's that B plus wire to replace now. This blue wire here probably also should be replaced. Where does it go? It goes down here to a tube. get to the blue wire that's underneath it here which goes right down here to the uh, tube socket this wire right down here it needs to also be replaced that's this blue wire that runs along the back here as you can see where's it go that's a green wire the blue wire comes around to other tube socket right down here. That's the one I have to change. Now, which it does. As you can see, the insulation's all cracked on here, right? So that also has to be replaced, and that's going to the same side as this capacitor here, going to the tube socket right down there. I doubt very much that much attention was paid back in the day, 1933, 34, when this thing was made. I doubt very much whether they paid much attention to placement of wires back then.
Okay, those are the major ones I've done. Still got a few more that uh, are going to definitely be problematic, that's for sure. I'm just going to power this thing up and see if I can get any tone through my um, from my audio generator. The cap is the grid to the, this is the second stage. So if I place my tone generator on here between ground and the cap, I should hear it on the output. So that, what that tells me is that tells me my audio output's working and it tells me this tube is working. Right, so, because the audio, this is the detector. Detector and audio output is here. So the audio comes in from, this is the IF here. So what's not working on here is my front end. As you'll hear, if I turn up the output from my, my generator, I could um, input an audio signal to this, you can hear. So this tube, this one, that one's obviously working. Uh, everything from here forward is working. Let's take a look at what we get on the cap of this tube on the scope. Let's see if there's any signal there. Well, here we go. Here's the tuning dial. And as you can see, I got a signal here. We've got RF there. I don't see any audio on here. On the digital scope, I'm seeing noise as well. It's not definitely not an audio signal, but this is probably the IF signal coming in. So I'm just doing some voltage measurements here. I should have about 180 to 200 volts here at 218. This is feeding in. This is the B plus. It should settle on around 180 volts, apparently. That is taking voltage down to my volume control. Should adjust the volume or adjust the voltage here on the um, cathode, which it does. The voltage goes up when you turn the volume down the voltage comes down when you turn the volume up that's here mm -hmm. the plate should be should have been this yellow wire, which is this one I replaced with a black wire. And that's got my plate voltage that comes up to here. So that's that's got voltage on it. That's coming in through this transformer down through here. And that's what couples the signal into. So I should have RF. If I look at the plate here, I should have my RF from my antenna should be arriving in this transformer. Let's uh, let's check it. I should have RF on there. With with DC voltage of course. And I do here's my oscillator when I turn the tuning capacitor. Doesn't look right though, does it? But that's coming off the plate. So we know that it's doing something. One thing you notice when I adjust the volume control, the amplitude changes.
but I don't see any signals. Although I don't have an external antenna connected, which might impact this because there's no antenna on this radio at all. I have to connect it to an external antenna wire. I just so happen to have an antenna wire here hooked up, so let's just connect it and see whether we get any type of signals coming in at all as I sweep through the, the frequency spectrum. I have some sound. Listen to this. It's very weak. But I have more than I had a few minutes ago. Now it might be that one of these tubes is weak too. I I don't have a tester handy. But uh, I got a friend that's got a tester, and he's actually the guy that brought me the radio. So maybe I'll get him to bring his tube tester by, and we'll test these tubes. I'll put an external antenna to this thing and see whether that will make any difference. Well, definitely hooking up an antenna made a difference. Signal's still pretty weak. But it's showing here uh, like a loop antenna between ground and the antenna terminal, which I don't have. I just got an antenna connected right to here. I don't have this side. So that might be making a difference right there because my antenna is connected right to that. There's a, a ground wire and an antenna wire here, and I have a feeling that probably there was a back on the set that had a coil wire around it, which formed part of the antenna system. So that might be making a difference. But we're definitely coupling something in now because I've got some sound. I wonder if I can just tweak this thing. I'll try adjusting some of the capacitors on here, see whether it makes any difference. Shut up. He was a plastic tweaker on that one.
Well, as you can hear, we've got some sound out of it now. Not much. Definitely not enough. But I'm going to uh, end this part one of this video right now because uh, I'm going to get the tube tester back and uh, we'll test the tubes on it. There's no point in troubleshooting anything further until I verify that all the tubes are working. We know the audio output tube works because I can I can inject an audio signal into it and it's nice and loud if I tap in here. So we know that the, the audio output's working, the amplifier's working, the uh, rectifier's working, but I don't know whether we may have a problem in one of these two tubes here. So I'm going to end this video now. We'll call this one part one. And hopefully in the next couple of days, I can get the tube tester back from the guy. The guy that brought me this radio actually loaned me the tube tester that I tested. I showed you guys a couple of years ago. So I'm going to get him to bring his tube tester back so that we can test these tubes here and see whether we're up against a weak tube because there's no point in chasing down anything else in here. All the capacitors have been replaced. I replaced some of the wires that were really in bad shape and to say we got we got sound now i don't have much for an antenna on there i've only got a piece of wire about 10 feet long that's hooked up to it right now so i don't really have a proper antenna but we are picking up one of the local stations on it i'm going to end this part one right now we'll continue with part two once i get a tube tester and then we can test the tubes and that'll be part of the part two video anyway thanks for watching and we will continue this one shortly <laughs>